Um, hi, I'm Monte uh, from FoxGuard Solutions. We provide uh, patch information for all ICS, kind of industrial control system devices. If you need to monitor those, like you probably do. Today, we're gonna to talk about replicating nation state style chipping attacks. Uh, and we're gonna do that on a Cisco firewall. Uh, if you do have questions afterwards, uh, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and email and so forth. And uh, a quick shout out to Thomas Weeks who put this picture together based upon the uh, profile I did a couple of days ago. Chipping firewalls, I like that. Okay, uh, let's get started. Will this me be made available after the call is something I see in the chat. Joe, I think you have a uh, you have a site, and if so, I will send this to you afterwards. Um, and no, I did not really put a plate of nachos. That was Thomas Weeks. I almost said photoshopping, but he corrected me. Uh, he uses GIMP, and he wanted to make sure that that everybody understood it was it was the GIMP. So, um, all right. The big hack. So you may remember uh, from a little more than a year ago, Bloomberg posted this article that said perhaps there were uh, malicious chips added to motherboards of, of particular computers um, that showed up in Apple data centers uh, and Amazon data centers, uh, giving uh, China control of these machines remotely. So um, that was. It, it made quite a bit of news. Maybe you remember it, maybe not. Um, so what, what is this chipping attack? It's, it's adding additional hardware um, to a motherboard to uh, allow, in, in this case, uh, remote control of that board. It's, it's an interesting attack because it's generally impossible to detect with traditional methods. Like your antivirus will not see an extra chip on the motherboard or, you know, so um, it could be in various pieces of equipment. Um, it will survive re-imaging of the device. So if you reinstall the firmware or change the config or, or whatever you do, the hardware is still there. Uh, and it's probably introduced in the supply chain. I mean, maybe somebody gets into your facility, but more likely this is, this is a supply chain kind of thing. Uh, the only problem was, is that everybody denied it. Like after the news article, everybody said, no, Apple said, no, there, there wasn't any in their data center and, and uh, Amazon, nothing in their data center. And there were some military you know, folks who was like, no, no, there was nothing. So nobody actually showed up with the, with the actual chip after, after the article was written. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, searching for aliens. Um, so with that as the inspiration, I decided to, um, well, if it wasn't true, that doesn't matter. Let's make it true. Right? Why not? See how hard it could be. How hard, how hard could it be? How hard could it be? So let's look to see if we can make it true. Bloomberg staged their diagram and it passed off as analysis too. I'm, I'm reading the comments. So now y'all keep, keep, com keep going. Comments. I like comments. So let's make this thing true. Right, why not? And maybe look better than these costumes. We're making aliens. So the first thought is how should I run this attack? Um, my first thought, it's probably the easiest way, is look, I'm doing this at home in my basement, you know, and I don't like to work. <clears throat> so um, what would be the easiest way to make this attack? And I thought probably through a serial port, uh, either a serial port that has an external connection uh, outside the case of the device, or maybe uh, there might be like debugging serial ports on motherboards. It's not uncommon uh, to have a, a, a terminal that's, that's used for, for in that sort of debug process. So that seems sort of the easiest thing to do. If I could mount a small, very small chip microcontroller on the device, uh, I could probably access the serial port. And uh, it also sort of suits my environment. Uh, uh, as you may know, I do a lot of work in industrial control systems. And all of those devices have serial ports. Like, 
not just one, like several serial ports. You know, here's a typical device. There's on the front is like serial port one, or, or no, maybe this is serial port one, and serial port two, and serial point three, and it probably has a serial port or two on the front as well. So all of these things have serial ports. Um, and when I'm trying to decide which uh, device to attack, to hack, I thought about these industrial control system devices, but um, why not pick something with a little broader appeal? These Cisco firewalls uh, are typically first programmed by a serial port, the administrative serial port on the side. So that sort of cuts across industrial control systems and, uh, and the broader sort of internet. Uh, but seeing that picture makes me realize how old I am. I immediately think of my old Pentium Packard Bell. Okay. Um, talk has an NSA playset feeling. Yeah, that, that's sort of the information. Uh, excuse me. Uh, inspiration is how much of the how much of the those fancy attacks can we sort of do at home now as hobbyists? Thanks for those comments. Um, so serial ports, you know, serial ports. Um, in the simplest form, they're a transmit line, a receive line, and a ground pin. On these, these are these are a little bit older Cisco devices, Cisco ASA firewalls. I'm often because they were cheap. Um, you know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm good, but I might smoke one of them, right? So, um, about uh, about two or three of them off of eBay. Um, but th this works across any other line. I just picked these because they were easy. Your normal serial port connects on, on these devices like this. This looks like an RJ, well, it is, is an RJ45, kind of looks like an Ethernet port. But in this case, it's a serial port and it's used for uh, configuration um, of the device. Some of the tools that I, that I used, uh, one that came in real handy was this USB logic analyzer, eight channel, eight channel analyzer. Uh, it, um, you know, available from all your favorite Chinese sources at $8, uh, which by the way, I think there's something ironic about using cheap Chinese hardware to do a Chinese style chipping attack. But in any case, um, so eight channels, I can read like eight channels of serial data simultaneously. You know, like who cares? Well, I, I don't quite, but I do want to be able to read two. Normally, there's a transmit and a receive, and you're just you you just you're just getting the receive channel. But as I'm debugging this, I want to see the transmit too, right? The reason you see the characters you type is because they go out to the device and they get echoed back, and you're really just getting the receive side. But I want to get the receive and transmit simultaneously. So so this made it possible, and it 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 turns out it it, it made some other things possible too that we'll see a little later. We'll see a little later. Oh, eVlog, eVlog, uh, eVblog did those devices. That, that's cool. I mean, look, they're cheap, they're common, they're they're useful. I don't look. I don't get a payback for this. But if you're playing with this stuff, get get one of these. They're 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 sort of cheap and useful. They have some associated open source software, uh, Pulse View, and then the command line Sigrock, I think. Um, and this is what that software looks like. So uh, I connected it up and. Uh, here, here's the actual, you know, uh, voltage waveform going low to high as I connected it to a serial port. Down here are the zeros and ones bits that gets interpreted from that um, uh, from those uh, pulses, and then we interpret that as a UART signal, uh, a serial port, and these are the characters C, O, N, F, with a start bit and a stop bit. So that's what your serial communication really, really looks like. Um, oh yeah, there, there is, um, uh, back to the comments, um, the, there is a, a, a expensive, more expensive commercial one, Salia, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it. It's out there. Um, th those are fine too. Um, but this was cheap. So, your typical serial port though is plus and minus 15 volts. And I want to use a microcontroller that's sort of cheap and easy to add to a device. And plus and minus 15 volts will definitely fry it. Right? So 
um, that's a bit of a problem. Now there are driver chips to handle that for you to convert the zero and five volts that you generally get out of the microcontroller or the ones I use um, to, to translate that to 15 volts and back. But I'm trying to hide this thing on a motherboard. I don't want to add a second chip. One, one chip is plenty. So is, can I get around that? Is there, is there a way? And um, what I found uh, was an app note, actually for another project I was doing at 110 volts, but that's a different story. But this app note reminds me, tells me, that there are built-in protection diodes for these chips. Um, They're generally used to, to sort of deal with, with little static charges so that, so that the chips don't get fried. And, and they can only um, uh, sink a very small amount of current, like one milliamp. So I have to be, I have to be kind of careful with them, but it figures out that if, uh, if I pick the right size resistor, um, like a, about a 15K ohm, that I should be able to connect it to the 15 volts and not fry these protection diodes and still be able to read the signal. So, so I, you know, I, I, uh, the app note, right? Um, I've got an idea that looks like it'll work. Um, or maybe instead of 15K, I can use 5K. Uh, the thing, the thing is, is that that serial port is actually expecting negative 15 volts and positive 15 volts. And I'm going to have zero and five. I don't even really know if it will read zero and five because it wants negative 15 and positive 15. And, um, so what I do is, uh, throw together a quick test. I have this Arduino Mega. I generally have a bunch of Arduinos laying around. They're cheap boards, you know, to play with and zero and five volts. Um, I picked this Mega. I usually use an Uno, but I picked the Mega just because it had multiple serial ports. I was thinking at the time I might need them. In any case, I, I go through the test. I hook this up to, um, hook this up to the uh, firewall. And if I pick a small, a little bit smaller resistor other than the 15K, I can send and receive characters. I can, I can, I can communicate. So um, that's pretty awesome. And it turns out, you know, the 5K is a little out of spec, but it works and, and it doesn't burn this thing up. So I think I'm onto something. Um, man loves his hot glue. Yes, Mr. Weeks, I do love hot glue as a fast prototyping tool. Thank you for the comment. Um, all right, uh, so quick test, right? How fast can I test this thing uh, without going to a lot of work? And it looks like, it looks like it's gonna work. So now it's time to pick a chip. What chip do I want to try to use for this attack? Uh, a couple of sort of obvious candidates. Uh, first is this uh, AT Tiny 10, and that's the one in these tweezers here. Uh, this bill is just for scale. Those things are pretty small. That's a pretty tiny chip, and it's not it's not particularly rare or exotic or, or or anything. It's you know I bought a bunch of them on a on a on a roll, and I figured out later on I could get them individually. But um, and there's this there's this larger chip, somewhat larger, still fairly small. You know maybe fingernail size, maybe a little smaller. Um, and it's the AT Tiny eighty five. I decided to use ATtiny85 for a couple of reasons. Uh, it had EEPROM, which would give me some additional capability if I wanted to like maybe record things or um, think about timing in a, in a special way. And um, it was a little easier to program uh, than the ATtiny10. Uh, matter of fact, I can program that one with the uh, Arduino IDE, so that's easy. And I had a few of them laying around in, um, in my basement lair uh, on DigiSpark boards. So I um, decided to go with the, uh, with the ATtiny85 uh, instead. So here's, here's one of the DigiSpark boards. Uh, this is the power supply chip, which is bigger than the processor. And here's the processor, the, um, the ATtiny85. And if you look again from your 
uh, favorite Chinese sources. Well, actually this came from China through Amazon. Uh, five of these boards cost 10 bucks. So it's really not very much. And since it already has the USB connectors on there, it's fairly easy to program. Um, uh, just, just sort of quick and easy. And like I said, I, I had a few of those laying around for, for other projects. Uh, let's see. Well, no new comments or, or am I just not seeing them? Uh, all right. So now it's time to check the AT Tiny 85. It should work, but you know, before you go to a lot of work, uh, I just uh, tried to see if it could make the connection through the serial cable to the uh, uh, Cisco ASA firewall. Uh, and it looks like it's gonna work. So, so keeping my fingers crossed, it's looking good so far. So during the, the process, what I did was I programmed the chip while it was still on this uh, DigiSpark carrier, you know, so I could just use this USB. And then I would pull this chip off to put on, uh, on the actual motherboard when I got done. The way I did that was using this hot air rework tool. And people are asking like how much do these things cost? So again, I don't get, these aren't like affiliate links. I don't get any money for, for any of this, but just to make, you know, people's like, where do you get that? How much is it? Um, again, hot air rework, about 150 bucks from, from the Chinas. Uh, this microscope, pretty cool, 40 bucks. Uh, good for inspection, not actually great for soldering because it's not binocular, uh, but it, it, it's still pretty useful. Tweezers and, and, and also like this blue tack putty just to hold stuff down. It, it's actually pretty helpful soldering and working around. Uh, and for those of you who came to RSA, uh, uh, I brought this and, and, and some things to solder and desolder and, and taught you know, a few dozen people to pull chips off and put them back on. In just a few minutes, some people who, who hadn't even soldered before, hot air if you haven't used it, mm, it's awesome. Um, and I actually did use a, a small soldering, soldering iron to put them back on. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you have one of those laying around, but it could be somewhere between 15 and 100 bucks. <clears throat> Likes hot air too. Jealous of these tools. Miss doing electronic stuffs. You know, just start. Just start. And my, most of the tools, I mean, they're not super expensive. And, you know, you get to use them for multiple projects. So, all right. So, now I figured out the chip. I looked like the communication is going to work. Um, and um, so like, here's this chip. And if I just solder wires to it, I could, I could like super glue this thing to the motherboard and run these wires to wherever they needed. And then I'm, you know, I'm pretty much in, I'm pretty much done. Uh, originally there were supposed to be four wires, right? There's, there's power and ground and TX and RX transmit and receive on the serial port, but Again, um, trying to stay with a quick and easy theme. I'm not even using the receive right now. I'm just using transmit. I'm sending the commands blind. I'm waiting a few seconds. I'm sending the next command um, and, and, and it works. So I get to cut down a wire that makes it a little less visible. You know, if you were going to hot glue this thing or super glue this thing to a motherboard and run a couple of wires around, you know, you could put it about anywhere. And it's not like, Look, occasionally there are wires on motherboard. We call them bodge wires. Like this is maybe a factory bodge or, or maybe not, but occasionally you will, you will see a bodge wire. Um, so, you know, it might work out, it might not. I mean, I don't want it to look like this, right? Like lots of crap soldered all over the place because that's sort of obviously kind of flaky, but um, three wires. I, I can probably find a place where it doesn't look too bad to put that on the, uh, on the motherboard. So, and as I'm looking around, I actually found a great spot. There's the connector on the side that has USB and the serial and all these pins come through the bottom. And so here is power and ground and transmit and receive, and they're all right beside each other. Matter of fact, they're just, it's just barely larger than if I dropped the chip right in there. 
Um, so, so by the way, who wants to tell me the value of this resistor? Uh, anybody? Come on, in the webinar chat. Value of this resistor. You get three guesses. Uh, nobody? Come on, be with it, move it. Good guess, not quite. Uh, no, no, come on, I'll give you a hint. Its value is printed on the front of it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Samson. Um, and Mr. Far Farah, if, I'm sorry if I mess up names, you can uh, berate me about it later. Yeah, so this is, this is a zero ohm resistor. It's effectively a wire, right? Well, it costs virtually nothing, but I'm just playing with, you know, why would you use a zero ohm resistor? And the reason is in this case, because if I drop that chip, the AT Tiny in here, and here's the five K resistor that I need. And if I use the zero ohm resistor, then this pin will reach over to the ground pin that I need. And that thing just sort of fits. I mean, it comes pretty close to like fitting on the motherboard, no bodge wires, ooh, no bodge wires. So uh, I like that. So success and failure. Um, you see, up, in, up until this point, all the tests have worked, but the way they work is I have to catch the Cisco device as it boots up and take it into a special mode during the boot process. After I started this on, it didn't work. And what I found out was that I'm pulling power from the USB connectors and it doesn't power up the USB ports till after it boots. I mean, what's with that? So that's too late. I've got to catch it on the way up. So now I'm looking around the board again for five volts that I can run a bodge wire to uh, and pull in five volts when it first powers up so I can catch it in time. And while I'm looking for a place to connect five volts to, I find this chip, this dual channel power distribution switch. And as I sort of follow the traces, what I find is that this is the chip that's used to turn the power on and off to that, uh, to those USB ports. So when the microcontroller, when the, when the processor on the firewall boots up, it sends a, a low power signal to this chip, and then it turns on the power to the USB ports. Well, it also happens that the input power pin and the power going out to the USB ports are side by side on this chip, which in, in a bit of inspiration, and this might be the part of the hack that I am most excited about, um, I can just drop a blob of solder on there uh, between those two pins and now I get power all the time. And now, Sometimes, occasionally, you will see that on a board. It's usually a fault. It's called a solder bridge. Um, but uh, so it could theoretically sort of be there. But in this case, this solder bridge is an important part of the hack. So I really like that. That means the power stays up all the time to this device. It also disables the, you know, the two amp fuse sort of limit that the chip provides. But eh, who needs that? All right, so now I've shown you the chip. I've shown you it soldered on the board. Uh, anybody want to try to find it on this Cisco ASA uh, motherboard? Uh, you have about, uh, you know, 10 seconds and you got to figure out how to type it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Jan Caprifa? No way. That's fast. Yep. Yep, Corita, yep, downright, there it is. So look, it's a little crooked. And if you look at it carefully, my soldering isn't as pretty as factor soldering. And so, uh, you know, like at RSA, I would carry this board around and give it to people to, to look for the chip. With, with a few hints, people would generally find it within a couple of minutes. Um, you know, and this is, a, I, I'm not sure, but I bet this isn't the, the highest resolution coming across. So. I'm across the internet, so good eye. Um, but yeah, uh, there it is. Now, all right, finding Waldo. <laughs> so it's on the motherboard. It is on the bottom of the motherboard, 
And actually, you have to get, you have to remove 14 screws and turn the motherboard upside down to find it. So it's there if you look. Um, you know, how, how many of you, and, and, and you could do it with, with a show of hands in the chat, how many of you, when you buy a new piece of, of you know, like you buy a new firewall or new device, take it apart, uh, take the motherboards out, turn them upside down and look for additional hand soldered uh, chips on there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could probably do, I see some of the comments, I, I probably could do a little better soldering job on that and would, it would look a little less freaky. So, all right, no comments. I, I did get a person, I think, uh, uh, maybe the last time I presented it, who said, uh, who said they actually did, they actually did that and uh, they were paranoid enough that I believe them. Uh, you might be able to hide this though elsewhere. Not, in a way, not as much fun, but if you look over here um, at this, uh, here's the USB ports and here's the serial ports and they're in this metal can, maybe RF shielding can. If you unsolder the four pins on this can and pull the can off, that's what this looks like. Now I'm looking at the back side of this. We're looking at the front side here. The back side is here. And there's a hollow back here that's about the same volume as the hollow in the front. And it'd be an easy place to, it'd be an easy place to put the chip. Then you solder this can back on there and you couldn't even see it. And in that case, you'd you'd have to pull all these cans off to look for additional chips too. And, you know, even paranoid folk probably don't want to desolder half their, half their boards to look for the stuff. Um, a major Valley firm has acknowledged they have a formal inspection program for new hardware from Mr. Work. Thank you for that info. Um, you know, I, I think we're probably going there. We'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, building my last router, most of the time I had the motherboard laying out. If you build your own, you will probably take a look. All right, this is my secret weapon. These warranty void if removed stickers got straight from eBay. Look, they have, they have the holograms on them, warranty void, they have barcodes, they're unique serial numbers, right? So, so you put these on a device to show that it hasn't been tampered with, right? So you take the device, it's like, it's like supply chain protection judo, right? You're using the you're using the protection tools against people. It's like, oh yeah, of course it's fine. Somebody put this sticker on it. So don't open it. And it hasn't been, you know, the sticker's good. The, the device has to be great. So anyway, I love that too. Supply chain judo. Um, a normal serial connection might look like this. We, we've sort of gone through this cable. It's a USB and serial on this side. You hook it up to the RJ45 jack. I want to tell you though, a, a, little, a little secret um, that because there aren't resistors in this and because it runs at 15 volts, when you hook this cable up to the device, it overrides that microcontroller and nothing happens. Like you cannot see the effects of the microcontroller. It gets overridden. So while you're setting it up, you don't see anything. The only way to actually see the attack is to disable the regular serial port and hook up this eight channel analyzer to the port. Now, because it's a high input impedance device, you can actually see the microcontroller and the attack will run. So in order to actually see the attack, I disconnect the serial cable, hook up this high impedance a reader and watch the attack goes through. I use SIGROC to do that. And here's what it looks like. Up here is, up here is the serial port. In this case, it's SIGROC reading the, the serial back and forth. And down here is a window that I will use uh, to connect to the Cisco firewall with Ethernet uh, just for testing. So as, as I watch this machine boot up now, I see that it does this you have a few seconds if you, to press break or escape uh, to get into Raman mode. And then you can change it to say, hey, I don't need a password. And then I boot it uh, without a password. After I boot it, I copy the running config because I don't know what their IP addresses are or their regular firewall rules are. So I copy all those in place. And then I start adding, um, uh, uh, SSH 
to the device because if you're going to own this machine remotely, you should do it securely. So turn on SSH, and as the device comes up, this is the Ethernet window. I'm just running a ping down here to across the Ethernet connection, and, and I see it come up. Um, anyway, we go through and we add SSH, um, uh, reset the device, and then from Ethernet, I can run an Nmap scan. Nmap scan now shows this SSH port is open. That's good. Um, and, oh, the, the last step of the attack is this ping IP address. This is assuming that's my IP address. Since four ping packets, let me know it's up. And now if we look, I can SSH to this device using the username that I set up and password I set up and go to enable. So that's basically full remote uh, access uh, to this device across the internet uh, based upon this attack. Uh, chip. And this is where everybody types applause into the webinar chat window. All right. Uh, while waiting for the applause, I think we only got a couple of minutes left. So let's hit the final couple of pieces. Uh, this attack is based upon the, the Cisco password recovery routine and they define it on their website. Uh, but most devices, if you have local access, you can do this to it. People just don't expect the local access to be uh, a built in chip. Oh, okay, just as we've got a little extra time. Oh, thank you for the, the applause and the clap. Appreciate it. Uh, if we've got a couple minutes, uh, I'll take just a couple more then and, and won't rush the, won't rush the follow-up. Um, so um, it, it's, you know, it's a defined thing. So when I talked to Cisco and they sort of called me, it's like, what's up? And, and we sort of decided that this wasn't a, it wasn't a vulnerability. It's a feature. And I think in the future, um, uh, non-secured serial ports might be considered a vulnerability, but I don't think we're quite ready to do that, at the, consider them that way at the moment. We probably will in the future. If you think they're a vulnerability, you know, say so. Um, all right, so we put this chip, it adds an account, it turns on SSH, it pings you when it's done. Um, uh, you can't detect that, like you can reflash the firmware in this device, you can put in the new config, uh, and it will still happen when it boots back up. Now, let's think briefly, I also like thinking about the debug cycle for this. So let's assume you took one of these firewalls, and as typical, you put it on your desk, and you configured it with a serial cable, and you, you checked it with Nmap, and, and checked all the configs to make sure they were right, and they're all perfect because you're connected to it with a serial cable, which will overwrite the small signal of the microcontroller built in. So it is exactly the way you set it up. Now you take it from your desk and you put it in the rack in the server room and you reboot it and you go back home, you know. Now, if you happen to check on it again in a few weeks, you'll notice that, that maybe if you didn't have SSH turned on, SSH is now on. I mean, if you already had it turned on, you won't see that. But let's say you didn't have it turned on or you log in, you see an extra user account that you didn't put in. So you configure it over the network and reboot the router and that account still comes back. And then you configure it again over the network and reboot it and the account comes back. So, so the system administrator goes out, network administrator pulls the device out of the rack, puts it on their desk, connects the serial port to it, and writes, rewrites the config. This time it sticks. Because while that serial port is connected, the microcontroller can't modify it on boot, right? So now it looks perfect. Uh, they run through all their tests. They go put it back in the rack and they go home for, you know, check on it again. And if you, I figure I get like three cycles of this before they eventually pull this thing out and throw it away. Um, how do I secure against this? I'm glad you asked that question. We will talk about that shortly, um, Mr. Sampson. All right, um, we, there are some enhancements that sort of come to mind. Um, I, I, could, I could, right now it just catches it on reboot. The, the Cisco device has to reboot, either it's a power cycle or, or somebody just put it in the rack or the power blinked off or whatever. Um, I could probably add a bodge wire and reset the system whenever I wanted to, to, to change the config. 
Uh, right now, I told you I'm sending those commands blind, and, and that seems to work reasonably well, but I could actually look at the replies uh, if I wanted to try to get fancier with it. I'm not sure right now exactly what I want to do with that, but I might. If I did include the, the Rx receive line, I could uh, potentially, if when it was first configured by a serial port, I could capture the password um, and store that in the EEPROM. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I picked a chip with EEPROM, but I'm not doing that, but it wouldn't be particularly hard to add. Um, or maybe I could use the radio frequency in the chip to, to try to exfiltrate that password uh, across a, a small, very small distance. Defenses, how do we secure against this? Who knows what this, this picture is from? Anybody? Let's wait, okay. Um, so this was from a movie that I'm still waiting for, for somebody to name. Uh, yes, Shyamalama Ding Dong, uh, you got it, but but yes, that was a short version. Thank you, Bob Morgan. The Karate Kid, the, the real one, the original one. Uh, and, and what's that attack? Yeah. So anyway, uh, Mr. Miyagi would say about this attack, he says, if do right, no can defense. Right. So yes, the crane kick. So if do right, no can defense. And that's what I used to think about these hardware attacks. It's like, mm, you know what, if you do it right, mm. You can't really defend against it. In the meantime, I've decided that's that's a little too pessimistic. Um, there are things that you can do. You can take a look at 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 the the motherboards on your devices. Uh, it really doesn't take too long. You know, if you could teach almost teach a, a high schooler to do this, you teach them what a good and a bad solder joint looks like, and. Uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, and you could, you could do the basic, uh, a basic review. You could also come back and check your config, do a baseline and keep testing it every week, month, year, maybe every day, maybe even more, uh, to see if it's changed, because you may not see the change happen, but I am changing the config. So if you go back and check that config against your original, you will see that, that it has changed. Um, you could probably start doing firmware hashing and baselining. That is a slightly different attack, but um, something you might want to do. I think in the future we'll start doing RF baselining of our sites. You know, right now we sort of look maybe for Wi-Fi, uh, maybe for cell modems. I think in the future we'll we'll go and say this is what the the RF signature of our server room looked like last week. What does it look like this week? Now. Cisco does have, so just for the Cisco devices, you can turn off that password recovery uh, feature using no service password recovery command. I have never seen anybody use that. Matter of fact, as I buy these off the internet, nobody has ever set that. And that still may only be a partial recovery because if I'm catching it as you set the password, I'm not doing that in my example, but if I was actually reading the other line as well, I could, I could see the password. So I could still probably get in, but um, you know, use use the use the security features that are available. It certainly help. So what did I learn from this? Um, I learned that it's actually pretty easy to build. It's a bit hard to put in the supply chain. How would I get it in your site? You know, I might sell this again, buy them, sell them on eBay, or maybe convince your purchasing department that that if I can sell them to them for $100 cheaper, they may be, they should buy from me. Uh, maybe I could hit the component suppliers. Uh, like if I sell those uh, uh, RJ45 USB cans with the chip pre-installed to like Cisco perhaps, or if I have nation state level resources, I can intercept shipments along the way, detain them, delay them for a little bit, add a little something, something, send them back up the line. These are typically for targeted attacks by the way, a friend of mine asked me to always talk about this. It's, this attack is probably not your top priority. It's probably not your top priority. Why is that? Anybody? Why is that? Be as paranoid as the information the hardware will deal as sensitive if it's top secret. Yeah, you, you should be more 
more uh, paranoid for uh, more sensitive stuff. Why is this not your top priority? A couple of reasons. Um, it really depends upon the maturity level of your security program. And for instance, between the time that I first started doing this attack and now, Cisco has had something like three remote code execution vulnerabilities. Why would I bother to chip one of these devices if they come with remote code execution vulnerabilities pre-installed? That's the easy way, right? This is the hard, this is the harder way. So um, if you're not using firewalls and writing good firewalls and checking your firmware and maybe doing some reverse engineering on it uh, already, you're probably not ready to worry about chipping attacks. If you are doing those things, if you're doing all those things and you have a, a relatively mature program, then this is probably the next step. Let's start looking for, for hardware uh, chipping attacks. And there are, there are actually maybe some other things that you could do to this as well. I'm trying to talk with some suppliers about doing high resolution pictures of the motherboard. So when you get them in, you could check to see if they match, uh, uh, perhaps some, some other things as well. So, you know, I, I talked about looking for things that weren't quite right on the motherboard. Um, and on these motherboards, as I looked around, it's, it's sort of hard to see, but here on the left, that's some kind of like silicone blob over this stuff. And that looks pretty weird. Uh, and, and here's some other like factory original schmoo around these pins. It's, you know, it looks like some kind of corrosion or something. So, um, uh, you know, it may be a little hard to spot because of this, but, but, well, let me ask you this question. Oh, why do I think this is factory original schmoo and not a hardware attack? Why, why? Well, because who would do something like that? All right, well, that's it. I'm Monte. Um, you can hit me up on those uh, different channels. Uh, work for a company called Foxguard Solutions. Uh, Joe, you can uh, run questions or answers or whatever time we have from this point. Um, I think I've sort of followed along some of the, the talk as it went across. Uh, but that's it for me, unless there are other questions. Let me see. Yeah, I think we got most of the questions taken care of uh, in progress. If anyone has anything else, though, now is the time. And by the way, thank you, Monte. That was great, um, as always. So a nice little walk through how you too can be a like a state directed hardware implanting nasty person or whatever. Yeah, nothing else. With just a few hundred dollars. Nothing else. Confidence in Chinese cameras. If nothing else, annoy your friends at work. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Joe. Okay, looks like we're not getting any questions unless you're seeing something on your end, Monte. No, uh, you say you have a you have a, a link of site for these presentations. Yes, so there is a uh, YouTube site that if you're cool with it, I will upload this to either later today or early tomorrow morning. It'll be linked off of my website for now, and I'm trying to put together a more official website, but I've not had time. All right. So everyone be on the lookout. Are you doing the, are you doing the slides? Somebody asked about the slides, and are you doing the slides as well or just the video? Uh, okay. Just the video so far. Well, all the slides um, are on the video, can, so you can get to them that way if you really want to. Or... Yeah. Or send me, send me something, uh, hit, hit me up on Twitter and I'll send you the slide deck. So. It'll work. Thank you very much. All right, it. there's no other questions. Yeah, no, thank you, Monty, for your time and for uh, a fun presentation. One more question. Oh, wait a minute, we have Yeah, one would centralized logging catch this? It might, if, um, if your logging would catch the addition of a new username, um, can you, if you could, if you can catch that in the logging of the device, if you can turn on the logging, so it's like if somebody logs in and makes a config change, then it would show up in the logging. So you might. Uh, I'm not sure that people do that on a regular basis, but they might. Uh, it's not going to catch it like as a login, I don't think, because you're really logging in before the device boots up. But you might possibly catch it on logging with a little care. Okay. Tracking connection cables. Yeah, so the, the way this thing works is like, if you're actually watching the network, well, if you have SSH turned on, it might be a little harder to uh, 
see the traffic. If you don't have SSH turned on and now this SSH port's open or you're catching some SSH traffic, you should be able to see that. All right, I think that's, those are the questions.